Good morning. On behalf of the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, I want to welcome you all here today. It's a very important news conference, a very good day. My name is Kim Rudat. I'm the Regional Communications Manager, and let's get things started. It's a real pleasure to be able to introduce to you Transportation Secretary Mark Gottlieb. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everyone. Before I begin my prepared remarks, I just want to recognize a couple of people that are here with us today, Mayor Schmidt and County Executive Streckenbach. Appreciate all the support from the city and Brown County over the uh, course of the events that we've had happen here over the last month, and appreciate your attendance today at the, at the event. Well, as Kim said, we're here today to give you what we think is some very good news about the Frigo Bridge. This is really the news that we've been working very hard, our staff and our consultant and contractor partners and federal partners have been working very hard to be able to deliver to you ever since we had the incident that caused us to close the bridge back on September 25th. What we plan to do today is to provide you with some details about what caused Pier 22 to settle and caused us to have to close down the bridge, uh, how we plan to make permanent repairs to the bridge, and when, uh, most importantly, I think to the citizens of Green Bay and the region, when we expect the bridge to reopen to traffic. At our first news conference, when the governor and I were up here in this uh, very room on September 25th, the governor pledged that the state would move very quickly to investigate the situation and get the bridge open to traffic again. He acknowledged and understood the importance that the Frigo Bridge plays uh, to traffic in Green Bay, to the whole uh, northeast region of Wisconsin, and really to our whole state in terms of getting people to and from their jobs, goods to and from market, and tourists to and from their destinations. Um, we appreciate very much at the department the prompt action of the governor in initiating the process for us to be able to obtain eligibility for federal emergency repair funds to make these bridge repairs. And I want to especially acknowledge the assistance that we received from uh, the Wisconsin Division of the Federal Highway Administration and other folks at Federal Highways uh, who worked very closely with us to ensure that we were going to be eligible for those funds to repair the bridge. I also want to take a moment again to thank uh, law enforcement, both the City of Green Bay and Brown County and other law enforcement agencies for their prompt action to protect public safety, uh, both on the day of the incident, September 25th, for their prompt action to make sure that the uh, structure got closed down before anyone was uh, injured, and everything that they've done for us uh, since then to protect public safety in this uh, somewhat difficult time. And as the governor said when we were up on the 25th, safety continues to be our number one priority as we move forward to uh, to completion of the bridge. Uh, I also want to recognize, you know, my staff at the Wisconsin DOT, this has obviously been a, a sort of an all hands on deck kind of an operation for us, not only here in the Northeast region, but our central office staff. Uh, we've certainly brought in national experts in terms of consultants and contractors, and again, I acknowledge assistance that we received from the federal government, and we've all really worked together to, uh, uh, to secure the site, to investigate the cause, and to consider what will be the appropriate repair alternatives that we're going to talk about today. Our teams proceeded with determination to do their work in a thorough and complete manner. Uh, as I said, we've consulted with a variety of uh, national experts on this matter, and I think they've all done a great job and worked together very well. Um, and again, one more important word of thanks on, on this whole issue, uh, and that's a thank you to all the citizens uh, of the Green Bay area and all the travelers in northeast Wisconsin for your patience and cooperation during the time that we've had to close the bridge. We know that having the bridge closed is, uh, is difficult for you, and we're, we're working very hard to limit that inconvenience uh, as much as possible. So to recap the work done to date, uh, we are continuing with the investigation on the cause of the settlement of Pier 22, but again, we, we feel we've completed enough of that investigation that we're confident that we can announce today what we're going to do in terms of permanent repairs to the structure. Uh, as you can see out on the site and as you will see in the tour this afternoon, we've started stabilization work to ensure public safety and protect the structure as crews work out there to initiate the permanent repairs. And then, of course, we've evaluated a variety of different options for permanent repairs to, uh, to fix the bridge and get it back open to traffic. So we're standing here today less than four weeks. Uh, since this event happened and we're ready to discuss our plan for permanent repairs and we're going to provide the details on that. Our staff is going to provide the details on that in just a moment. But first I want to give you the news on our plans with regard to uh, our current plans with regard to when we will be able to reopen the bridge. Um, we will later today uh, be uh, releasing a uh, request for bids for contractors to do the permanent repair on the bridge. Uh, that contract will call for completion on January 17th. 2014. Now there will be a variety of um, 
incentives for early completion and disincentives or penalties for late completion, but January 17th is the date that we will have in our contract. That's the date that we're shooting for to reopen the bridge. Of course, I, I don't think I really need to add that this is a very unique situation. Uh, anything can happen as we, go, as we go forward with this process, but nonetheless, uh, January 17th is a date that we're looking to hit, and uh, we think that's an aggressive target, but it's one that uh, we've talked to contractors and, the, and that we've, we're fairly confident that we can, that we can meet. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to the rest of our staff to walk you through a little bit more of the details, again, of the investigation to date, uh, our plans for permanent repair, how that's going to work, what we're going to do, and, and then how we're going to get this bridge back open to traffic. But again, thanks very much. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our Northeast Region Director, Will Dorsey. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Will Dorsey, the Northeast Region Director. I'd like to thank Secretary Gottlieb for joining us here today for the announcement. Um, I'd also like to echo a couple of the comments made by the Secretary. Uh, first of all, our appreciation for local law enforcement to help us get us through this situation. Um, also like to thank the motorists for their patience throughout all of this. Um, we're embarking on a, a pretty busy traffic season with uh, holiday shopping, uh, deer hunting season, and uh, Packer games hopefully taking us through the playoffs. Um, so we anticipate you know, a lot of traffic, a lot of impacts, and, and so we re request your continued patience as we work through this to the end of January for the completion. Um, as the Secretary mentioned, we're proceeding on three tracks uh, concurrently on this, the investigation, the emergency stabilization work, and then the long-term fix. And uh, as you can imagine, this is a, a massive effort. Uh, to get this done, we've brought in uh, uh, scores of highly skilled people to work on this project. And I believe uh, behind me you can see a, an organization chart. Um, a couple of the folks that are involved on the project team, Tom Buchholz and Scott Becker, uh, will be talking shortly about the specifics of the investigation and the long-term fix. Um, but I, I just wanted to highlight some of the other entities and the individuals that are involved in, in bringing this, uh, this project to fruition. And uh, I'm not going to go through box by box on the org chart here, but just to give you an idea of some of the folks that are participating in the effort, um, we've got uh, the different agencies, uh, certainly the DOT is very much involved, but we also have Federal Highway Administration, uh, we have uh, city and county forces that have been working closely with us, uh, we also have uh, scores of consultants that are working on the project. If we don't have the expertise in-house, we've brought in the people that have the expertise to make sure that uh, we're doing the thorough investigation and coming up with the right solution. And uh, then also the contractors that uh, the Secretary alluded to um, when we go to bids on this. So uh, we think we've got a very good team put together. Some of the specific expertise that we have, um, certainly uh, Bureau of Structures is prov and, and others are providing structural engineers. Uh, we've got geotechnical experts. We've got environmental experts. Uh, we have a couple uh, corrosion experts that have PhDs, so really some, some kind of heavy hitters in the industry as far as analyzing this situation. And uh, so we're confident that uh, with this team, uh, we've done a thorough investigation thus far and we'll continue with that investigation and that we've come up with a solution that's going to not only fix the bridge but restore it to traffic by that end of January date that the Secretary alluded to. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to Kim. Thank you. Thanks, Will. That's certainly exciting news. And now we're going to talk about how we're going to get this done and get this bridge back open to the public by the end of January. We're going to start with the project manager, who you all met on the second day of this incident. His name's Tom Buchholz. He's going to talk to you about the investigation and about the uh, current stabilization that's going on right now. Thanks, Kim. Uh, just a quick update on the bridge monitoring. Um, Pier 22 hasn't settled any further from the last press release that was sent out probably two and a half weeks ago. Um, the department has installed uh, robotic survey monitoring on Pier 19. Uh, that robotic survey is monitoring Piers 13 through 25. We have a modem um, that can send the data down to a laptop in our office <coughs> and we can basically monitor that hourly. Uh, but really nothing else has moved. Uh, Pier 22 is the only one that has uh, moved since September 25th, the other ones have all remained uh, stable. So that's a good thing. Um, I'll update on the investigation phase. Uh, we really moved forward looking at the entire legal Frigo Bridge. Uh, we really focused on from Quincy Street initially to the Fox River and that industrial fill area, but then took a hard look 
the entire bridge. We went to the west side of the river. We did soil borings uh, in the Fox River, uh, looked at each of the abutments. That investigation is still ongoing and should be wrapped up this week. Uh, to date, we've taken 44 soil borings along the bridge. Uh, we've done 36 test pit excavations. I'm back up. So when I mean test pit excavations, it's really taking a backhoe down, exposing the face of the piling, really to see what the, the physical uh, properties of those pilings. So it's really just uh, trying to get a good visual of what's going on at each of those. So we've done a very thorough investigation of all those. Uh, so we're very confident where we're at. Uh, and then with these test pit, test pit excavations, we're also doing water samples, soil samples, doing all the chemical testing to find what uh, players are underneath uh, the ground, uh, what's uh, contributing to the factors that happen. Um, what we found and what we said at the last pe press conference is we found severe uh, corrosion at piers 21, 22, 23, and 25. This is really in an area, um, really has this industrial fill. It's a real black powdery material uh, similar to a fly ash or foundry sand that's very highly corrosive. Uh, Pier 24 is in that same vicinity. We did test pit excavations in that area. We didn't see the corro corrosion on the piling that we saw at the other four, but the general soil characteristics um, are in that same vicinity that we're concerned about that one as well. Just to point out, you can see we have uh, loss of the pile here from corrosion. You can see the severe corrosion. And then here's on Pier 22 down in this lower right, you can actually see the buckling of the pier. Um, so there again, as we said in the last press conference, the corrosion really caused uh, enough of the piling to basically buckle and then some of the good piling that maybe weren't as uh, lost much section uh, basically buckled uh, under that. And that all happened roughly at the eight feet below the bottom of the footing. Uh, we continue with this analysis and to compile a big geotechnical report um, that's a work in progress. Some of these corrosion tests that we're doing take 28 days to get done. So we're in the midst of doing all this investigation phase and wrapping that up. Our goal is to have that uh, entire report uh, complete uh, the winter of 2014. Uh, update on the stabilization contract. Uh, we let an emergency stabilization contract out to really uh, protect the infrastructure of that deck. Uh, Lunda construction of Black River Falls is a little bitter for $1.6 million. They started a week ago, Monday, on October 14th on that stabilization work. And really what the fix is, is to provide uh, temporary towers to support that structure. And it's basically pounding casing pipes 25 feet into the ground um, through that industrial fill. And then they're pounding or inserting piling into bearing and then they'll build the towers off of that. As of this morning, all the piling are in on all the towers, um, and they're working on the north tower. So if you do the media tour uh, later today, you can see the work on the north tower. The plan is to have uh, towers in here at the end of this week, and then the trusses um, that sort of are gonna support this underneath. You'll see one uh, west one going in uh, next week, and then the east one, east of Pier 22, will actually go in the following week. So we hope to have that wrapped up early November uh, to support that stabilization and then we can move on to the permanent fix. So how are we going to fix this bridge? We have Scott Becker. Scott's our Chief of Structures from Madison from our bureau in Madison and Hill Farms came up today to talk to you about that and he's going to uh, explain that right now. Scott? I'll get that display up too. Okay, thank you, Kim. I guess what I'd like to do is to take a couple of minutes to talk about the concept, conceptually what we're doing here to fix this. Um, where I'd like to start with, he's, he's getting a display ready that we'll talk off mostly in the elevation view, but as mentioned, as you can see behind me, it uh, 20, piers 21 through 25, this repair will be done on all five of those piers similar, and then we'll be doing some additional work at Pier 22 to jack the bridge back into its position. Um, I'd like to call your attention to the plan view here that we're, that we're showing, if you, that there's a before and after, if you want to, there you go. There's a before and after, and you can see basically what we're doing is extending the footing out and putting in four 60-inch 
shafts, drilling those shafts in an extension from the footing. So if you look at uh, to the next slide here, um, if you look at this is sort of what we have existing, and then we'll get into this diagram here is which we're really where I'll do most of my talking off of. What we're going to do is drill down approximately 120 feet into the bedrock and socket those shafts in about seven to eight feet into the bedrock itself. As you'll notice in that 120 feet, about 30 feet down, we've got these blue PVC that's the, to protect the shaft from any, any potential co corrosion. We'll also have high density concrete as well as we'll have epoxy coated bars to protect anything that we have in that shaft. Now if you can kind of look up above where the existing footing is, you'll see the encapsulated footing here. And what we're doing there is we're putting post-tensioning bars, we're drilling it through the bottom of the footing, as well as through our new footing. And what we're going to do is basically post-tension that or squeeze that together to transfer all the loads coming down from the bridge into our new shafts. And that's to the goal is then to not have to, to uh, rely anything on these piles. So we're also putting up here is what, what's called a buttress, basically doweling that into the columns and doweling into the footings to tie that load transfer into our shafts. And this repair will be done, as I mentioned previously, on all five of the piers. On Pier 22, once we have the strength in this system here, we will move to the top of the pier and we will jack the pier, uh, the superstructure and deck back up to its original location, so approximately two feet. We'll then pour concrete and steel in there to, to encapsulate that area in the pier and then the structure will be put in position. Prior to opening in traffic, we will go up and inspect the deck and, and the riding surface to make sure it's safe and serviceable and then we'll be ready to open up to, to traffic. Um, so you may, that will get traffic open, but we will be doing some potential preventative maintenance and service-like type of work around some additional piers or these piers, uh, you know, over the spring and summertime. So that, but traffic will be in and these are not structural repairs that we'll be looking at. So I think with that, um, I think I've hopefully described what we're doing for the fix. Actually, I think we have another slide here I, I should say to talk a little bit more about the schedule. I know the Secretary talked about the schedule, but as we said, the bids are going out today. Um, hope, hope, or we will be opening next Tuesday, October 29th, the bids. And from that, we're anticipating a start date of November 4th. And as mentioned, uh, January 17th is the date that we hope to have this bridge open up for service. So with that, okay, we'll open it back to you. We'll have that display available for you. Just want to wrap up a couple of things here before we go to the Q&A. Um, first of all, uh, the PowerPoint will be available to all of you. Uh, just give us your, uh, your email address. We'll send it to you. We are going to be available for interviews after the news conference. The secretary will stay. Scott will stay. I will stay. We're also going to have um, one of our traffic engineers here if you have some questions about traffic. Um, as for updates, again, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We'll keep uh, giving you updates as needed. Certainly as things change out there, we'll be sending out video to the media. And then after today, as things change and we do get an availability out there, we will be bringing media on site for media tours. It's not going to be every couple of days, but it might be at least every couple of weeks we can get you out there. The one thing we can't do is we can't interfere with the work going on out there, and there's not a lot of room. So keep everybody safe, but we will try to get you back there if we can. Um, this afternoon, we're going to meet at the same location on Quincy Street. Bring your safety gear. If you don't have it, please uh, see us, see Mark, and uh, we'll provide it to you. The briefing's at 1 o'clock sharp, so get there a little early if you need safety gear. Dress warm. Last time we took you to Pier 13. Today we're going to take you much closer. We're going to get you out to Pier 18. And as we explained, we're going to show you some of the stabilization work that's going on, and you're going to get that much closer to Pier 22. Um, after the tour is over, the tour guides are going to be 
Tom Buchholz and also Bruce Anke. You, Bruce Anke was, if you remember, did the media availability last week, and they'll both be available for interviews, um, and I'll be out there too. Now, before we go to the Q&A, if you guys want to come on up here. So are you ready? Randy, come up too. Randy Asman's our traffic guy in case you have some traffic questions. Okay, let's start the questions. Anybody? What are you going to do to ensure the public that once this is done in January, that that bridge is safe to drive over? Uh, I'm not quite sure, Patty, I understand your question. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking it, it seems like it's for, for the serious problems that the bridge has had that we've heard from your engineers that all of a sudden in January, the bridge is going to be safe to drive over. Okay. Um, First of all, it's not all of a sudden. We've been working very hard on this. As, uh, as Will explained, we have a lot of people working on this issue. Um, frankly, we're not going to open to the public unless we're absolutely sure. <laughs> Proof is in the pudding. It's, you know, our staff and our families will be driving over it as well. Next question. When did the January date come up? When was that kind of figured out? Uh, that was developed during this last week as we were coming up with the design and um, uh, obviously uh, uh, coming up with some information as to what the design would be and how fast it, we could build it. And additionally, there's a se real sense of urgency, obviously. As, the, uh, as you heard, there's some incentives and disincentives in this, in this contract to try to push this forward. How do you balance the incentives with also ensuring safety is number one? Okay. Um, sure. you know, on that schedule question, we really tried to get in and do the contractor maximizing as much work, looking at you know seven days a week, 20, 24 hours a day, to try to get it done as quickly as possible. To address the safety thing, we've even with the stabilization contract, we've gone in and we have seven o'clock uh, safety meetings. We talk about the work going on, and again, it's a sense of urgency, but it's also a sense of organize, organizing and communicating out in the field what's happening, who's doing what, and doing all that in the field is really, you know, a, a means and method. The contractor doing it the right way in an organized way, it'll get done safely. Thanks, Tom. Um, along with that, again, the secretary mentioned at the top of the conference about safety. Governor emphasized safety, and this is not lip service. No one has been killed. No one has been injured. We want to keep it that way. Next question. Um, my question is for, for Scott. Okay, uh, Scott. I, I just wanted to ask um, why this strategy was one that you felt was, was the one that you guys should go with for, for repairing the bridge. Um, interestingly enough, this, this strategy was proposed by our consultant team. Some of the contractors came in and our own bureau staff. It seemed to be the one that everybody was leading in. Really, we wanted to make sure that it was a very robust structural system. So the, the drilling of shaft into the bedrock really would ensure that, that all that load would be carried and away from all that soil. So no matter how, what the soil conditions were, we would put everything structurally down to bedrock. And it seemed to be one that, out of all the alternatives, that just kept coming back to us. And it's, it's a very robust system. And do you see having to do any other types of improvements? Would you consider this an improvement to the bridge or just stabilizing it more? Uh, this is just putting it back into the service that it's originally designed for. This, this really won't be an, an improvement, so to speak, but it'll give it its life that it had before. Scott, how much of the bridge, how many of the other piers are already resting on bedrock? Um, well, all the piles are driven uh, to different levels of depth throughout the plan, so uh, there's Plenty of them um, that are, and some of them that aren't on the bedrock, but all of those have gotten plenty of capacity, over capacity. And, and, and in those areas that aren't resting in the bedrock, uh, though we don't see these corrosive soils or this issue of what we have in Pier 21 through 25. How have you determined that the corrosion isn't there? Have you excavated all of the other piers? Um, Tom, I think we've done the soil borings, and I'll ask Tom to. Yeah, we haven't excavated every pier, but you know we use the bridge information back from '74, which did soil borings, and then we're doing soil borings uh, additionally at nearly all every other pier to verify that information back from the '70s, 
And then also we randomly test pit in some areas to visually confirm what the pylon condition was in, and then also confirm that the soil type is what the boring showed from the 70s. You did soil borings on uh, all of the other piers? And we're in the process of doing that, yeah. Is it possible that you'll need to, to do this kind of structural support on other piers then, and depending on what you find? Uh, by what we've seen preliminarily, the, these are the only ones with this corrosive, ag 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 aggressive type of behavior we've seen, and all of the other borings have not shown that we've needed that. Is so, the borings are for to look for corrosion or to look for to, to assess the soil type. This is the, the the fly ash and that type to make sure that that's where the corrosive area was to make sure that we know what the other soils were, and and, and they have. And we're in the process, as Tom said, to get all the borings for all, all the piers. So you have like 20 uh, pilings under each leg of each pier, right? Yeah. Each pier is different. Roughly, but each pier is different depending on the height and where it's at. On pier 22 then, how, much, how many of the pilings were badly corroded and how many of them uh, buckled? And uh, are we safe in assuming that all of them were either corroded or they buckled? We exposed three of the 40. And we saw severe corrosion and saw buckling at three of the 40. So we're assuming the other 37 are in the same condition, given that we visually looked at three. Do you know what is in the soil that's causing the corrosion? Uh, yeah, we do. It's an industrial fill. You know, I, I call it, you know, I don't know, fly ash slash foundry sand. And one of the tests that we run is resistivity. And that's a highly corrosive, generally on new retaining walls, the, the measurement is in ohms, um, and a number higher than 3,000 is what's required in this industrial fill area. We have numbers down in 200. Lower is worse. So, you know, it's relative to a number, but it's highly corrosive stuff. I just want to uh, reiterate one thing that, remember, these are the five piers that we've identified that have, and four of them have been corroded to the point that we feel need to be, need to receive this repair in order to open up the whole bridge. We are, we have been researching the other piers as well, um, looking at the soil content, that sort of thing. We're not seeing anything remotely like what we found through these piers. But as Scott mentioned to you, that doesn't mean as our research continues and as we do our analysis, that after the bridge opens, we may be out there doing some sort of preventative things just so in our minds we know that we're going to get the service life out of this bridge that we intended to get. And I want to reiterate another thing too, we said this right from the top, um, this has nothing to do with the design of the bridge or the, or the construction of the bridge. This was a good bridge, it was soundly built, um, and, and it's meant to last a long time. Next question please. Go ahead. Um, to anything to the soil at, yeah, I mean, in this I location? Mean, the soil is the part that's causing the corrosion to sure. here. I mean, what's going to happen? Is that going to happen again? So next is the okay. Soil well, no, no. Remember, this soil is concentrated in this location. Okay. Yeah. And oh. I'd like to add Go ahead. to this, we are we are putting in those sleeves you saw, the right. protective sleeves, on that to protect the shafts that we have. Plus, we're putting epoxy and high-density concrete, so this corrosion is onto the steel and not to the concrete. So we're doing everything we can to prevent that from the system that we're putting into place. So then you're using preventative measures, but we're not affecting the underlying original issue in the soil? I just want to understand correctly. Okay, I think your question is, is the corrosive situation still going to be there? Yes. Yes, it will be. And so what we're doing is we've come up with a method which to put these other pilings down that's going to correct, uh, protect them. I think how deep was that going to be, the, the, the protection? PV, the PVC, 30 feet. 30 feet down. That should more than uh, traverse the area of the, uh, of the corrosive soil. Next question. There was some confusion on Highway 72 when people were heading towards 41 South. Is, was there any sort of a 
Okay, this is Randy Asman, A-S-M-A-N. Randy? Yeah, there was a change made on the Highway 41 project uh, overnight where, <clears throat> excuse me, 172 westbound to 41 southbound, that ramp location changed overnight. And there was some obvious confusion this morning. Unfortunately, a lot of people got redirected up to Lombardi, turned back around to go back south. Uh, we have message boards out. We had a press release out. So we need people to understand <clears throat> in order to make that move in the future, uh, including right now as we speak, instead of going north towards Marinette, you're going to have to continue west on 172, go underneath 41 to get on that loop ramp. Things are going pretty good. Um, we made some changes last week at the 43 and 172 interchange. We uh, received a lot of tremendous great feedback on what we did there. Um, you know, we're continuing to talk to the city of Green Bay, their staff, both the police staff and their engineering staff, to make sure that we're on top of where traffic is being rerouted. Um, you know, January, January is three months away, so we got a ways to go, but it's a lot better than you know going through another you know tour season and so on. So. Um, in the big scheme of things, it's, it's going pretty good, but there's times of the day where we do still experience those delays. Let's take another couple of questions. The, uh, will you be able to tell us all the consultants who have worked with you on this? Uh, will we be able to get all their names? They're on the oh, yeah, they're on the, they're on the chart, and we're certainly going to make the chart available to you. Scott, is there uh, unanimity among that, all of those folks, or is there some debate uh, over the, like Scott, the permanent fix here? Are they, are they all in agreement, or has there been some back and forth? Uh, the, well, when we started, first conceptually, there was good discussion, and, and this is really the consensus of everyone. So there was some fine-tuning of the specific details that came from different parties, but yes. It's Can you talk about some of that fine-tuning that went on? Um, the, it, in, not to get too technical, but cer certainly the size of the PT bars, um, this buttress that I described, um, some of the doweling, uh, uh, really into the design special details. Which ones are the PT bars? Um, the long black bar that's going across through, through those. I guess I have the pointer here. I probably could use it. <laughs> right uh, there. I wonder if it's, if it's necessary to go down to bedrock with these structures, why is it not necessary to have the entire bridge resting on bedrock? Um, we, we've got more, piles are designed with way more than enough capacity, and right now they're, the ones that are in, that are functioning correctly have way more than enough capacity than they need to support all the loads that are above them. So there would be really no need to take those piles down to bedrock. How do you know they're functioning correctly? Um, based on some of the tests and the, and the description that we have for the soil characteristics and to know that, that they were driven to that capacity and we've seen no visual signs of any distress. Let's take one more question. So has this like this been done before or is this Your question was, has this been done before? Yeah. Okay, just get. Um, certainly some of the protection that we're adding is a new concept, but this has been done in a lot of seismic area, to, uh, seismic retrofits uh, to worry about earthquakes and that type of thing. So. This is not a new fix, um, but certainly the concept has been out there. Any cost estimates? Um, no, and I'll explain why. Um, this is a competitive bidding situation, and we don't want to do, to do or say anything to jeopardize that. Um, as you've seen the schedule, when we open up the bids, we'll know what this part costs. Um, we've been upfront about the temporary stabilization, as uh, Tom mentioned today, 1.6 million. And so uh, those figures will be coming out as, as we award the bid and we'll be able to fine tune that for you.